So I was amazed uh, the day after Christmas, our neighbor brought out the Christmas tree and put it down by the curb. Wow, they've already de-decorated. You know, other people have started turning off their lights and uh, even before New Year's. And that's a discussion that goes on in our family year after year. When should we turn the lights off? The outside lights, the lights on the nativity outside, when do we take down the tree? How long should we wait? How long should we keep the lights on? Our son, our firstborn, Nathan, used to say, Dad, it's not good if the lights are still on past the middle of January. There's another pastor who shared that a family in his neighborhood left their lights on for nearly two months after Christmas one year. And it aggravated him. He thought, if they're too lazy to take the lights down, at least turn them off. But then one day late in the middle of winter, a sign appeared in his neighbor's yard that read, Welcome home, Jamie. He was humbled to learn that the family had a son in the military and they had left the Christmas lights on as they anticipated his return. The light of Christ that we shine at Christmas are lights that remind us they're symbols for the hope, the living hope that we have in a dark and dreary world. As we continue the birth story today, the strange events of the last several months were just beginning to settle down for Mary and Joseph. Mary was recovering after the birth, and Jesus was adapting to life outside of the womb. Even Joseph started to get comfortable with the idea of being a father. Mary and Joseph were probably glad to participate in the predictable, ordinary ritual of taking their baby to the temple to present him to the Lord and to do their own purification. Yes, things were beginning to settle down to some kind of normalcy for this new family as they made a way to the temple to present all of themselves to the Lord. We're going to read from Luke, the second chapter, beginning with verse 21. And I invite you to receive the word of the Lord. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, According to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, the, the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took up in his arms the baby and blessed God and said, Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. 
And Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years, from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to him of all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's interesting. In order to understand what's going on here in the biblical story, you have to have a Jewish way of thinking that you've got to go back to the history <clears throat> of the laws during the time of Moses in Leviticus and Exodus to understand what's going on now into the future. So we understand, and if we read in the 21st verse, the first thing you would do that was custom in the book of Exodus, it says, on the eighth day, the child will be circumcised and the child will be named. You know, our daughter Kristen, when she was little, and we were gathered around the, the table celebrating Advent as we made preparations for Christmas. We would pray after we would light the Advent wreath and it was <clears throat> her, term, her t time to pray that one night. And she prayed simply this, Thank you, Jesus, that Mary and Joseph named you Jesus. See, Mary and Joseph were obedient in little things. God told them to make sure that they named the baby Jesus. And then God told them to make sure they go to the temple and have the baby presented unto the Lord. So on the 40th day after his birth, which was traditional in the book of Leviticus, a firstborn male child was brought to the temple and presented to God. After offering a sacrifice as a ritual of redemption, the parents would then take the child back home with themselves. And so on this particular day, Luke records for us this original ritual. Luke's subtle mention, though, as you read in the story, he says that they offered two turtle doves or two pigeons. It gives us a little detail into what's going on in the life of Mary and Joseph. You see, when you read back in Leviticus, the offering that should have been made was a lamb. But if you didn't have enough money, then you would bring two turtle doves, two pigeons. So we know besides being in a faraway place, having the baby born in a stable or a cave, but the baby actually laid in a manger, represented that Mary and Joseph were poor. The story goes on and it tells us when this poor couple from Bethlehem arrive at the magnificent temple in Jerusalem, notice that there's no mention of priests or biblical scholars who greeted the newborn baby. Instead, the holy family encountered an old man waiting to die and an old woman waiting to see her vision fulfilled. Must have been a tender scene as Simeon extended his old, wrinkled hands 
to the soft, cuddly flesh of this newborn child. Simeon's eyes dimmed by age, now resting on the unfocused eyes of this newborn Son of God, Jesus Christ. God's gift of salvation, Simeon could see clearly. He had been waiting faithfully for years, patiently waiting, hoping and believing that this gift of salvation would come. He was ready to receive what God was doing in the world because all along he was expecting God to act. Wish we had that same expectation in our lives. Could it be that we often, often miss truths and the understandings that God wants to give us because we're not open to the new things God is doing in the world right now? Could it be that we are so consumed by worrying about the bad things that may happen that we miss the good things right in our midst? I wonder if we're so consumed by the hype and the fear of the pandemic that we are missing what God is trying to teach us trying to do in our lives, even in the midst of the pandemic. The Christmas event is about a God who loves us so much that he became one of us, born among us, looking like us, feeling like us, struggling like us, living and dying like us. A God who is willing to come us and be among us must be willing to get his hands dirty in the human condition. But a God who comes to us in love and truth is also going to be resisted. And as Luke tells us from Simeon's proclamation, it would cause the fall and the rise of many. Old Simeon had lived long enough to know that if God really wants to bless us and to save us, then somehow this God must confront the worst about us. The terrible things we do to one another and the terrible things we do to ourselves. That cuddly, cooing baby in Simeon arms would grow up to speak the truth to us and then die for us. And that is our joy. But it's no simple joy. It's a joy that is much more complex and valuable than most of what passes for Christmas joy these days. It is a joy that somehow does business with our pain with our sin, with our confusion, with our cruelty, with our bullying, with our fears, and with our brokenness. Mary and Joseph were just beginning to think the life was starting to settle down again. And then Simeon reminds them that God's intrusion into your, their lives lasts forever. And you know what? God's intrusion into your life and into my life lasts forever. Simeon wasn't ready to die until he saw God's salvation. And none of us are ready to die either until we have seen God's salvation. And you know, the ironic thing is that we aren't really ready to live either until we see God's salvation. Live to the fullest. Simeon was a patient person who was willing to wait upon God. 
The word patient implies a willingness to stay where we are, to live obediently in the present and wait, believing that God will, will reveal what we need to know in his time. Impatient people expect the real thing to happen somewhere else, and therefore they want to get away from the present situation and go elsewhere. For them, the present moment is empty. But patient people dare to stay where they are and wait. knowing that all good gifts come from God in his own time. I asked you at the beginning of the service if you could remember a situation. You had to wait a long time before you got to what you wanted. So I'm going to try to share some of the responses that were sent this morning. Pastor Nisi uh, said, <laughs> I'm still waiting for someone to drop off just $1 million in cash. Thought we could have fun with this. Anyone, anyway, if anyone wants to stop my waiting, feel free. Bobby wrote, waiting for the closing of my first house 20 years ago so I could finally move in. John wrote, waiting. Jeannie and I were engaged to be married for 22 months as we each finished college in different parts of the country. Maynard said, healing. Beverly to become a nurse. Kristen Willits, waiting to go visit my grandmother's during this difficult time. Jane, waiting for my son Easton to speak his first word. Todd, returning to sports after an injury. Sweeney's birth of two weeks overdue, firstborn Matthew. Robert, waiting to, for the dots to connect in life. Pastor Nisi writes again, waiting on your return, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Anyone here want to share what they've been waiting a long time for to happen? Anyone? Anyone? Just, just write there quickly. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? For me, the longest wait was when my uh, father was in a coma and I was in the intensive care waiting room for 24 hours after his first heart attack. Long wait. You and I aren't the only ones who have to deal with the challenge of waiting. The psalmist writes, Long before Simeon and Anna were recorded in the Gospel of Luke, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. Waiting often feels like a waste of time for us today because our culture is always saying, get going, do something, don't just sit around and wait. I think that's why many of us are struggling through this pandemic. We don't like to be inconvenienced, to wait until we don't have to wear masks, to wait out of quarantine, or to wait for things to open up again, or to wait for the vaccine. 
Waiting also becomes even more difficult when we are frightened. Not just as individuals, but as whole communities and nations. Fear makes it harder to wait and it tempts us to act rashly. Those who live in a world of fear are more likely to have aggressive, hostile, destructive responses than people who are not so frightened. The more afraid we are, the harder waiting becomes. Our prayer should be, oh God, before we act hastily and risk doing more harm than good, give us the patience to wait prayerfully for your wisdom and your guidance. It's interesting as we continue in the story, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke raises up women. It's countercultural to that day where men were male and prominent in the culture, but women were always lifted up in the Gospel of Luke. So when he gives a, a male version of, of a situation happening, a lot of times you'll see that women are brought parallel with them. And remember, women were first at the cradle, they were at the cross, and they were first at the resurrection story. Praise God for women. So Luke goes on and he tells a story about Anna, a prophetess, a disciplined, devoted, diligent woman. Do you know anyone like that today? I do. And I live with her. And I'm probably going to get in trouble right now. But you know, Tuesday after the first big snow, we had the privilege of uh, watching our new grandson, Charlie. And uh, Jan and Tim are taking turns with Chris and Mary. And when Ben and Kristen both are at work, we get opportunities to watch Charlie. Oh, the highlight of the day. But this was our first one. And it was Tuesday after the great snow. Kristen told us that Charlie's been having a little bit of a rough time getting his naps. Well, Jan was determined she was going to get him down. Charlie wasn't going to have anything to do with it. So she tried, 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 tried. Said, okay, finally, get the front pack. So we put the front pack on. We bundled them up. She said, I'm going outside. I'm going to walk in the snow. I said, where are you going to walk? Not all the sidewalks are clear. Oh, I'll find a way. So she went out, basically in front of our house, she went out back and forth for 30 minutes. I watched her walking up and down. As soon as she got outside, he was out. Another 30 minutes go by, and I'm like, where is she? Couldn't find her. So I texted her, where are you? She said, I'm in the garage. <laughs> it got cold, colder, and the wind picked up. She said, I'm just standing in the garage. You know, she stood in the garage for over an hour. Then she finally came in the house, and another 45 minutes went by before Charlie woke up. For two and a half hours, she carried him in her pack. That's devoted. But you know, Jan's devotion goes further than just taking care of Charlie. Christmas Day, just the two of us, she said, you know, we need to go and deliver some of these points set us to the people who are at home. Okay. And we need to go to Bandera and get those meals. And I told some of the neighbors we would be dropping off the meals. Okay. And then we made a visit to the Wadmans. Ken had just died. We didn't know that. We pulled up and they had just taken his body away. And Jan went and prayed with Lois. And she put her hand on the, the door, the glass door, and touched Lois's and she prayed with him. And then yesterday, as I sat here and watched behind the scenes, we did our first Zoom funeral, a witness to the resurrection for Ken Wadman. And Jan wanted to make sure that the good news of Christmas was heard clearly to the 100 people who were on Zoom watching, who were overcome with grief. But you know, Luke tells about a, another woman who was even more 
devoted than Jan. It was Anna. She was at least 84 years old. Anna literally lived at the temple. She had been widowed only seven years after their marriage. And since her husband's death, she had spent her life worshiping, fasting, praying, and waiting in the temple day and night for God to fulfill the vision he had given her. For more than 60 years, She went to the temple daily. Anna waited. Yet we never heard Anna say, God, you are making me wait too long. It's not fair. It's not right. She could have become bitter after her husband's death. After all the as a childless widow, was, their life was hard and fragile. But Anna didn't complain. Instead, she turned to God and put her trust in him, waiting patiently for God to act. And because her spirit was open to God's spirit, she immediately recognized the one who came to redeem Israel when his parents brought him into the temple. Even though he looked like a most unlikely savior, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying helplessly in his mother's arms. She took one look at the child and recognized the Messiah and immediately began to speak about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. It's a shame that many people today do not realize the significance of the child who was born at Christmas. Even though we have the advantage of knowing the rest of the story. But Anna was ready to receive God's good Christmas gift. And when she did, she joyfully shared the good news of salvation with others. Have we, have we shared that story? Elf was coming, beginning of February. Think about who you could invite to share that story with. As we conclude this morning, the good news in Simeon and Anna's story is that God's timing and plan are worth waiting for. Instead of regretting or resenting the wait, they used the time to focus on the promise. They used the time to develop their prayer life, their worship life, their testimony, and to prepare for the day when the wait will finally be over and Jesus will come again. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. As we begin this new year of 2021, could we be more like Simeon and Anna? and expectantly wait for the miracle that God is working in the world? Let us be obedient to God's will, and let us be a faithful witness to others with our whole lives, no matter what circumstances we may encounter. Let us pray. Father, the holiday is over. But the work of Christmas is just beginning. Loving God, guide us as we follow in the footsteps of the one 
whose birth, Jesus Christ, we celebrate. Oh God, this morning I pray that you would grant us the grace to order our lives so that others might know that we have come and we have knelt in Bethlehem. We have knelt at the manger. We have given our lives to Jesus Christ and we have worshipped the newborn King. And I pray, God, if there's anyone this morning who hasn't worshipped you, that they would give their lives to you this day, this very moment. Lord, on the threshold of this new year, let us to remember to follow the star instead of the crowd. As we begin this new year, God, help us to be more like Simeon and Anna. Help us to expectantly wait for the miracle that God is working in the world. Let us be obedient to God's will and let us be a faithful witness to others with our whole lives no matter what circumstances we may encounter. Lord, as we come to your table this morning and we eat of the bread, the body of Christ broken for us and we we drink of the blood of Christ, cup of salvation shed from us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit like you did with Simeon. Lord, the holiday is over, but the work of Christmas is just beginning. Let it begin with us as we pray with gratitude the prayer of the one who calls us to new life, Jesus the Christ taught us to say when we prayed together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.